Good morning, and welcome to another in our series of legacy forums about the Nixon administration's ideas and innovations. Uh, I'm Jeff Shepard, and I'm here on behalf of the Richard Nixon Foundation, which co-sponsors these legacy forums. What makes the Nixon administration so interesting is it marks the uh, beginning of the foundation of the modern presidency. Uh, what happened in the course of the Nixon administration is that policymaking, actual governance, was drawn from the cabinet into the Nixon White House itself. So before the Nixon administration, the cabinet departments really ran their own areas except on giant issues. But beginning with the administration and lasting through today, policy is made in the White House itself. And while the cabinet departments have input into policy, they mainly execute decisions made within the White House. How did that come about? Has to do with three organizations. First, the revitalization of the National Security Council with Dr. Henry Kissinger, where foreign policy was really made within the White House. Second, the creation of the Domestic Council, the counterpart to the National Security Council, under John Ehrlichman, which did the same thing on major domestic issues. And finally, the transition of the old Bureau of the Budget to the Office of Management and Budget, which not only counted the money, but held departments to objectives and to accomplishments. And that was under George Shultz. George Shultz is the first uh, 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 director of the Office of Management and Budget. But before George Shultz was director, he was Secretary of Labor. And what we're going to find, the topic today, he was well nigh an ideal cabinet member. And the, the discussion today on labor and employment issues in the Nixon administration largely stems from the innovation and leadership of George Shultz. We co-sponsor these forums with the National Archives. And we're thrilled to be here in McGowan Theater to talk about this and to co-sponsor with the National Archives. And my job really is to introduce the archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. David, as you may know, uh, uh, is a librarian. Uh, he was head of the New York Public Library be before taking over the archives. And before that was a librarian at both MIT and Duke University. He's a scholar. He's a man of great integrity. And it's a genuine pleasure to be co-sponsoring these events with him. David? Good to see you. Thank you, Jeff. I want to add my welcomes to all of you here to the McGowan Theater at the National Archives. We're delighted for the second time in less than a month to welcome the Nixon Legacy Forum here to the National Archives. Over the past two years, the National Archives and the Nixon Foundation have co-sponsored 15 of these forums, bringing together Nixon administration alumni and alumni to examine, explore, and analyze particular aspects of the 37th President's domestic and foreign policies. Legacy forums are now planned throughout 2012, which will mark First Lady Pat Nixon's 100th birthday on March 16th, and through 2013, which will see President Nixon's centenary on January 8th. For many today, the Nixon years, the late 60s and early 70s, are so near and yet so far. But as these forums have demonstrated, many, if not most, of the problems we are grappling with in 2011, including the environment, energy independence and health care were first being faced in their modern aspects beginning in the 60s and 70s. It is a happy actuarial fact that there are still many men and women who served in the White House agencies and departments during the, those critical years from 1969 to 1974. The archives has the papers, some 45, 44 million of them for the Nixon administration, not including tape recordings and other historic materials. And those are available now and forever to citizens and scholars. But the foundation has an equally unique historical resource, the men and women who actually created those papers. And that is what these forums do, reunite the papers with the people who wrote them. The richness of the insight and analysis that results will also be available here and will increasingly become a central part of the Nixon administration's archival record. Today's forum on the administration's labor and employment policy includes three very distinguished participants and a no less distinguished moderator. It will be my pleasure to introduce her, 
and she in turn will introduce them. Ann McLaughlin Corlogas served President Reagan as our nation's 19th Secretary of Labor. Before then, she had, an undersecretary, had been Undersecretary of the Interior and Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Mrs. Corlogas first came to Washington during the Nixon administration, where she served as Director of the Office of Public Administration at the Environmental Protection Agency. Since leaving government services in 1989, Mrs. Corlogas has been President of the Federal City Council here in Washington, Chairman of the Aspen Institute, and Chairman of the Rand Corporation Board of Trustees. Among the several boards on which she now serves is the Reagan Presidential Foundation, Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome Ann Carlogas. Thank you. Thank you, David, and good morning, all. Um, we're going to be talking this morning about the Nixon administration's labor and employment policies, um, a topic that might at first sound rather esoteric or even unrepossessing, or perhaps as a Republican president, uh, it could be a short topic. But I think you'll find, especially through the eyes of today's panelists, who were there at the time, who were actually present at the creation, so to speak, it is a surprisingly interesting and lively topic, and also surprisingly relevant to many of the same issues we are dealing with today, and the same problems we're also facing today. It's remarkably timely, though our emphasis on President Nixon's administration, one's thoughts may travel to yesterday or today's newspaper. With labor and employment issues, as with so many other domestic issues in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Nixon administration was dealing for the first time with the modern aspects of the issues that have remained true and in many cases remained intractable over the last four decades. As earlier forums have shown and as the archivist has indicated, this is true with environmental concerns, energy independence, health care, welfare reform, and many, many other domestic issues. The 1960s and 70s witnessed cataclysmic changes, economic changes, technological changes, and no less but entirely unique to that time, countercultural changes that gave the new and modern face to many of America's very old problems. By the time Richard Nixon was elected in 1968, he had already been a major player in American politics for going on a quarter of a century. He served as congressman, senator, vice president, was candidate for governor, and served, of course, as a prominent public citizen. He was no stranger to labor concerns or labor issues. His first assignment in the House of Representatives in 1947 was to the Education and Labor Committee. As he later said, he and another newly elected Democratic congressman, John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts, sat like bookends at the far end of their respective sides of the Education and Labor dais. The committee and the House were immediately involved in the controversial Taft-Hartley Act, which is still in effect today and still the center of controversy. During his vice presidency, Nixon had the opportunity to observe and work with Eisenhower's respected and successful Secretary of Labor, James Mitchell. Mitchell, from New Jersey, my own home state, was a Democrat who had been a director of industrial personnel at the Pentagon during World War II. He also had been an industrial relations specialist at Macy's and Bloomingdale's, and he was seen by labor as a management side of the table. Labor didn't really trust him. He was an opponent of discrimination in employment. He believed in labor management cooperation, and he was concerned about the plight of the migrant workers. He's often been referred to as the social conscience of the administration. In, in aside, in 1987, when I was becoming Secretary of Labor under President Reagan, I carefully scheduled a meeting with then Lane Kirkland, who was head of the AFL-CIO. And in our conversation, I asked him, okay, who was the best Secretary of Labor ever? And he said, Ann, you'll be surprised. Not knowing at the time, I suppose, he said he was a Republican. Jim Mitchell, Labor Secretary under President Eisenhower. And I said, why? And he said, well, one, he had the President's ear, 
And two, when we were at Bell Harbor for those annual meetings, he wouldn't mind coming down the hall with a bottle of scotch, joining us. I should add, maybe if you can put this off the record, I can do both, I told Lynn Kirkland. <laughs> Dick Nixon and Jim Mitchell became close friends. In fact, Nixon seriously considered the labor secretary as his running mate in 1960, especially after working behind the scenes mediation at the behest of President Eisenhower with Sen uh, Secretary Mitchell, um, who played the public role on uh, some of the uh, steel strike uh, issues that were so current at that time and I'm sure will be touched on today. Nixon's personal intervention trying to help settle that bitter 1959 steel strike won him considerable and in some cases reluctant respect from labor. But with the election of JFK and then LBJ, with the arrival of the new frontier and the great society, it seemed that tr the traditional alliance between labor and the Democratic Party was solidly cemented. Union leadership and union money lined up behind the Democratic standard bearers. In 1968, Nixon's opponent, Senator Hubert Humphrey, launched his presidential campaign with a speech at New York City's Labor Day Parade. The election was razor thin, and labor's $6 million came close to helping push Humphrey into the White House. But the forces that would challenge and replace that traditional labor-democratic alliance were already at work and Richard Nixon was there to recognize and encourage them. And in fact, despite labor's solid financial support for Humphrey, some 30% of union members had actually voted for Nixon. By January 1969, when Nixon was sworn in just down the street from here at the Capitol, the pent-up frustrations of four years of unrestrained spending for guns and butter for the Vietnam War and the Great Society were beginning to surface and the generational disillusion and disaffection caused by the countercultural revolution was now in full force all across the country, from living rooms to campuses to union halls. The Nixon administration enjoyed a brief and deceptive honeymoon in 1969 because most of the collective bargaining contracts would extend until 1970. Sure enough, 1970 saw the most serious epidemic of strikes since the end of the Second World War. Postal workers struck for the first time in history, <clears throat> and there were hard hat riots in several major cities. During 1970, 41.5 million man days were lost through strikes, an increase of 32% since 1969. As wartime production slowed down, unemployment rose during the Nixon years. In 1968, before Nixon began, troop withdrawals from Vietnam, the unemployment rate was 3.3 percent, the lowest it had been since the Korean War. By 1974, however, the unemployment rate was at a worrying 5.6 percent. All considered, that's almost half of what it is today, and when I left the Labor Department in 1989, we thought we were well at full employment at 5.5 percent, down from 11. So as the patterns of employment were also changing, in the decade from 1966 to 1976, the Northeast alone lost a million factory jobs, most of them moving to a more friendly climate of the South and the Southwest. This period also saw the beginning of outsourcing. An estimated million jobs moved from U.S. factories to foreign subsidiaries between 1966 and 1971 the unions faced a very new dilemma. They could demand and get higher wages. But at the end of the day, what was really gained if the employers started moving jobs overseas or cutting back on investments? This was also a time when union membership became relatively younger, while union leadership remained resolutely old. It was observed that under the leadership of 75-year-old George Meany, the average age of the AFL-CIO Executive Council was 63, putting it in the same league as the Vatican Curia and the Chinese Politburo. Younger union members were restless. The average weekly wage had ris risen from $95 in 1965 to $171 in 1970, but real purchasing power had declined. 
At the end of 1970, a survey found that half of all industrial workers were worried about their job security. 25% were worried about their safety because there were 14,000 fatal on-the-job accidents in 1969, far more than the number of deaths in Vietnam. 28% of workers had no medical coverage, 38% had no life insurance, 39% had no pension besides Social Security. The war in Vietnam, the excesses of the counterculture, and the rise of civil rights movement had seriously shaken union solidarity. Many union members were fiercely patriotic, and they watched aghast as college students waved Viet Cong flags and rooted for an enemy victory. With the apparent support, or at least the acquiescence, of much of the Democratic, Democratic Party's leadership. And in many areas, and in many industries, the threat of competition from minority workers suddenly became an overriding issue, all creating the platform for a most active, most innovative, even compassionate Nixon Labor Department and union support. In an odd and unique turn of events, the Republican Richard Nixon represented the standards and traditions and values, and yes, seemed to represent the prejudices of many hitherto Democratic union members. The nomination of George McGovern as the Democrats' standard bearer in 1972 led to the unprecedented situation in which labor and labor's money sat out the election. In his memoirs, President Nixon records a 1972 golf game at the Burning Tree Club in Bethesda. The presidential foursome included Treasury and former Labor Secretary George Shultz, Secretary of State Bill Rogers, and AFL-CIO President George Meany. At the 19th hole, they sat for an hour talking and smoking cigars. As they walked to the waiting cars, Meany told Nixon that he wasn't going to vote for him or for George McGovern. But you'll be doing all right with the Meany family, he said, because his wife and two of his three daughters would vote for him, for Nixon. Then crusty old Meany put his hand on the president's shoulder and he said, just so you don't get a swelled head about my wife voting for you, I want to tell you why. She don't like McGovern. It was truly a memorable moment in many ways. Before there were and before there could be Reagan Democrats, there were indeed Nixon Democrats. So before I introduce today's panel, allow me to say a brief word about my three Nixon administration predecessors who served as Secretary of Labor. President Nixon's first Labor Secretary was George Shultz. As these legacy forums have demonstrated, Nixon was a notable spotter of talent. His choice of the Dean of the University of Chicago's Business School to be his first Secretary of Labor launched one of the most impressive and important careers of public service in the history of the Republic. If Richard Nixon had done nothing other than give us George Shultz, he would forever deserve the nation's gratitude. After only 19 months at labor, the president named Secretary Schultz as director of the Office of Management and Budget. And then in 1972, he named him Secretary of Treasury. At labor, as we will be hearing, Secretary Schultz was involved in the manpower training bill of 1969 and played a vital part in the Philadelphia plan for non-discrimination in federal construction projects. I served with George Schultz in, uh, in the Reagan cabinet and on the Reagan Library Foundation board today, and uh, briefly on the General Motors board, which is a topic for another discussion. And he is still, uh, you will hear, uh, what he was in the days of the Labor Department and the Nixon administration. I talked to him a week ago and told him I'd be moderating this panel and I told him who was on the panel. And he said, really? He said, all those guys worked for me. And indeed, they did. Secretary Schultz was followed by James Hodson, who served from July 1970 until February 1973. Secretary Hodson had worked in industrial relations positions before being appointed under Secretary of Labor in 1969 and then Secretary in 1970. Under his leadership, OSHA became the law of the land and he also played an amazingly strong role 
and expanding employment and training programs through the Emergency Employment Act of 1971. Union leader Peter J. Brennan served as Secretary of Labor from February 1973 until March 1976. During that time, some very significant legislation became the law. CETA, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, and the Rehabilitation Act in 1973, and ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act in 1974. You can see that many of those initiatives respond to the mood of what I described earlier that uh, the Nixon administration faced. But today it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. You can read their extended biographies in your program as well as in Who's Who or Wikipedia. And you can sometimes find Judge Silverman and Bill Kilberg in the headlines today. I'll just remind you of the positions they held during the time we will be discussing. Bill Kilberg has been a White House Fellow, Special Assistant to Labor Secretary Schultz when President Nixon appointed him as the solicitor for the Department of Labor in 1973. At the time of that appointment, Bill was the youngest ever to be appointed to a sub-cabinet position in the United States government. Well, not as well known, I share with you a small story. Bill and his wife, Bobby, were both White House fellows in 1969 to 1970, with Bill working for George Schultz at Labor and Bobby working for John Ehrlichman on the Domestic Council in the White House. The two White House fellows had their engagement party at the White House on June 12, 1970. It was Bill's 24th birthday. Secretary Schultz toasted them with the observation that, and I quote, it might be argued that this is carrying fellowship just a bit too far. Our next panelist, Michael Mosco, joined the Nixon administration in 1969 as a senior staff economist at the Council on Economic Advisors. He went in 1970 to the Department of Labor to become Assistant Secretary of Policy and Research and uh, he was appointed Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at the Department of Housing and Urban Development following that, and uh, then, of course, Under Secretary of Labor in the Ford Administration. But what's not known about him is that as recently as 2008, as a widower, uh, Michael married at the Cole Children's Museum in Glenview, Illinois, a woman by the name of Suzanne Kopp, who was a lawyer, and counsel at one time to T-Mobile. And finally, but not last or least, led Judge Larry Silverman, our third panelist, who joined the Nixon administration in 1969 as Solicitor of Labor Department and was appointed Undersecretary in 1970. After a brief time in private practice, he became Deputy Attorney General in 1974. Now, Something that is known is that both Mike and Bill worked for Larry, so you can anticipate a lively discussion today. But what you might not know is the story of Larry's, oh, I could call it a fight with the White House, not the President, but some differences of opinion on occasion. When it caused him to be fired, and there had been an attempt to move him to the Ninth Circuit, saying that he don't belong in politics, he's due too, too rigid. I haven't found that in my years of knowing Larry, but we'll see what kind of stories and more importantly, how we might fill out the marvelous record of President Nixon's administration and the work at the Department of Labor. We'll start with Mike, who will make some remarks, then Larry, then Bill, and then go into some questions and discussions among ourselves. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. Uh, I think the key thing to remember about the beginning of the Nixon administration uh, from the economic standpoint is that it was a completely different environment uh, from today. The major issue, the major concern in the country, as Ann alluded to, was inflation. Uh, during the 1960s, we had uh, Johnson administration had very expansionary fiscal policy. Monetary policy was accommodative. Uh, during that period. 
And as a result, we had very high inflation coming into the latter part of the 1960s. I joined the administration in the summer of 1969, as, as Ann said, as a staff economist at the Council of Economic Advisors. And at that point, the key driver of inflation was viewed as the construction industry. Uh, again, this is the complete opposite of today. Uh, at that point, the unemployment rate uh, in construction was very low. Today, it's very high. Um, and wage increases in the construction industry were running at 20% a year, about twice the average of wage increases in the manufacturing sector of the economy. So the political pressure on the administration and the Congress to do something about inflation was enormous. Uh, the, and actually, at that, this point, the Business Roundtable was formed. Today, the Business Roundtable is a major lobbying group for large multinational comp companies. It was actually established as the Construction Users Anti-Inflation Roundtable, chaired by Roger Blau, who was then chairman of U.S. Steel at that point. And their major purpose was to lobby the administration on reducing costs in the construction industry. The administration took a series of steps. Um, in 1969, the uh, Council of Economic Advisors issued what were called inflation alerts to identify to the American people the importance of inflation and different sectors where inflation was important. In September of 69, the president established a cabinet committee on construction, chaired by Paul McCracken, the head of the Council of Economic Advisors. This committee had a, took a series of steps, including directing federal agencies to cut back their new spending on construction projects by 75 percent. And they encouraged states and cities to do the same thing and private sector firms to do the same thing as well, to reduce the pressure on uh, resources in the construction industry. In, again, in September of 69, the President, by executive order, established the Construction Industry Collective Bargaining Commission, which was a tripartite group that was set up labor management and public to deal with structural problems in the construction industry. It was uh, John Dunlop, uh, who was then a very well-known labor uh, economist at Harvard University, was heavily involved in this, and he was one of the public members. He was chaired by George Schultz. And uh, I became the second executive director on that Construction Energy Collective Bargaining Commission in 1970 and moved to the Labor Department. But by 1970, inflation was not improving. Uh, wage increases were still very high. And Congress passed the Economic Stabilization Act of 1970, which gave the president the authority to impose wage and price controls. Uh, now, no one ever thought that Richard Nixon would impose, use that authority to impose controls. He was strongly opposed to wage and price controls and spoke about that frequently. But this was a political move to make inflation an issue in the next election. Uh, they could, the Congress, Democratic Congress could say that the president had the authority to do something about inflation and he didn't do it. Well, the construction, at that same time, the leaders of the national leaders of the construction unions were very concerned about inflation, very concerned about these large wage increases in construction, as were the unionized contractors. But the union leaders were in a very difficult political position. They couldn't agree voluntarily to uh, reduce wage increases. This would be selling out their members. But they knew that over time, this was going to lead to an erosion of unionized construction and the growth of the non-union sector in the industry. And that's exactly what has happened over the years. They knew their self-interest. So we needed uh, John Dunlop, working with the members of the Construction Industry Collective Bargaining Commission, came up with a plan to have wage stabilization in the construction industry. And, but the union leaders needed some type of political cover in order to implement this. I mean, they just couldn't be viewed as selling out their members. So it was arranged to have a meeting with the president, on, and it took place on January 17, 1971. And the union leaders were there, the unionized contractors were there, and Nixon was supposed to take a hard-line stance. He was supposed to demand that the parties come up with a voluntary plan 
to reduce wage pressures and price pressures in the construction industry, and he was supposed to give them an ultimatum as well. So as I sat at that meeting, I kept waiting <laughs> for the president to get tough, to give them the ultimatum. It never happened. He was not tough at all in the meeting. He was too easy. He never gave the ultimatum. Um, he did ask for a plan, for them to come back with a plan with 30 in 30 days. And we can speculate why he wasn't tough at that meeting, but he just wasn't. Uh, so there was no political cover for the union leaders. They did come, took them more than 30 days, but they did come back with a plan. It was an inadequate plan. And on February 23rd, Nixon surprised them by suspending the Davis-Bacon Act. The Davis-Bacon Act is an act that sets prevailing wages on federal construction projects and federally assisted construction projects. And it's administered by the Labor Department. And it seems that frequently the prevailing wage is the union scale. And this, of course, gave a great advantage to the unions and the unionized contractors because there was no lower wage coming from the non-union sector on those projects. So we suspended Davis-Bacon. The solicitor of labor, Peter Nash, at that point, said that his suspension, President's suspension of the federal law, actually um, suspended 38 state Davis-Bacon Acts as well. So this was obviously, this was a bit of a stretch. Uh, and in any case, we were clearly at war with the building trades at that point. And it was a war that no one wanted. So on March 29th, Nixon then imposed wage and price controls on the construction industry using the 1970 authority that Congress had given him. And he also reinstated Davis-Bacon. The union leaders had the political cover at that point and agreed to cooperate. They set up the Construction Industry Stabilization Committee. John Dunlop chaired this. This was a tripartite group, labor, uh, management, and public members. And it was successful in moderating wage increases in the construction industry. In fact, this, it was so successful that it gave support to those who wanted to have wage and price controls in the entire economy. So this was March of 1971. And then, of course, we know that on August 15th of 1971, the president surprised the nation on a Sunday night speech announcing his new economic policy, which included a freeze on wages and prices for 90 days in the entire economy to be followed by a phase two with a, a price commission and a pay board to, again, control wages and prices on an ongoing basis. Now, the CI, the, the Stabilization Committee in the construction industry was tripartite, as I mentioned, and the pay board was set up to be tripartite, but it was clearly not successful. Um, and it's interesting to contrast the two, because the pay board to control wages in the entire country is almost an impossible job, given the dynamics of the, the American economy and the scope of the American economy. But it was set up tripartite. George Meany served on the pay board initially, along with other union leaders. So they had, that was one strike against them. It was such an impossible task. The second was they appointed someone, jo Judge George Bolt, uh, to take responsibility ahead the pay board, he had no experience in the labor area whatsoever. In the Labor Department, we had recommended at least a half a dozen people to head the pay board, people who had experience in the labor field and could understand how to deal with unions and management. All those recommendations, all those recommendations were rejected. Bolt took charge. It eventually broke off. The union leaders left. Um, and it was no longer going to be a tripartite group. Uh, now, inflation did subside temporarily in 1971 and 1972, and it did probably help Nixon get reelected uh, as well. But, of course, it didn't last. Uh, this type of uh, trying to put a, uh, a control on a pressure cooker just couldn't possibly last. And um, I think what we've learned from this is that the only real way to control inflation is sound monetary policy and fiscal policy. And it was only when Paul Volcker took responsibility for the Federal Reserve in 1979 that we got inflation under control. I'd say the other thing we learned is that there's a whole group of us uh, who 
will stand at the barricades to prevent wage and price controls from ever happening again in peacetime in the United States. As Ann pointed out, when George Shultz came to the Labor Department, he had as a model for Secretary of Labor Mitchell's performance back under the Eisenhower administration. And under the Eisenhower administration, the building trades unions were sympathetic, almost overtly sympathetic to the Republicans in many respects. And the AFL-CIO was not quite as determinedly part of the Democratic Party constituency as it became more and more as time went on. So that his model for labor secretary was less hostile to trade unions as was true of some, not all, not Ann, but some who followed under other Republican presidents. So he had a balanced group of people in the department. One, Bill Ustry, came from the machinist union. And the rest of us were, none of us were perceived as hostile to trade unions. With respect to labor relations itself, the dealing with uh, unions on collective bargaining, Willard Wirtz and pre before him Arthur Goldberg in the Democratic administration had spent an enormous amount of time, effort, and publicity at actually working at settling labor relations disputes, settling strikes. Arthur Goldberg became famous for running around the country settle, settling disputes. And Willard Wirtz tried to do that as well. George Shultz decided when he came into office that was a profound mistake. He once said, if, uh, as Secretary of Labor, if you hang out your shingle regarding settlement of disputes, you'll get all the business. Uh, and so he did not do that. The one area where there was enormous pressure to settle disputes was in the transportation industry, airlines, railroads, <coughs> part covered by the National Labor Relations Act, part covered by the Railway Labor Act, because those could result in national disputes that would paralyze the country and which would uh, sometimes require the government to go into federal court to get an injunction under a provision of the Taft-Hartley Act. Those were nightmare situations because if you went to Congress to try to settle a national emergency dispute in the transportation industry, you ended up with 535 arbitrators. And it was a chaos. Now, the trade unions did not mind that so much as alternative approaches because they largely controlled Congress, or at least they had enormous influence. They had a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House. So they didn't want any particular changes to that. But it was, as it was a nightmare, uh, we came up, George Schultz directed us to come up with legislation to deal with it. And <clears throat> we came up with legislation, and we also had another, I'll tell you about the legislation in a moment, we also had another weapon. The weapon was Bill Ussery who was the most extraordinary mediator that I think this country ever saw. He was like, it was like a miracle. He would go into a room full of management and raise a flag and talk about patriotism and then go into a room through, uh, full of union members in vicious dispute, use the same speech, then go back and go to sleep. Uh, and, but he would know after only 15 or 20 minutes with people what their bottom line was. So he would miraculously put together a settlement. And he became enormously effective in dealing only in that area, in the, the area of uh, transportation potential emergencies, where there was a, ne a necessity for the government to play a role. But we came up with legislation which uh, has its still life today. We couldn't get it passed. It was called final offer selection, and it was a device whereby when there was an emergency, the government would have the authority, after a quick injunction, to set up a panel which would 
then have a decision to make between the labor position and the management position. It would not arbitrate. It would not have any authority to split the baby. It had to choose either the most reasonable position, last offer prevented, presented by the employers, or the last offer presented by the union. And the theory of it, uh, of that bit of legislation, was that it would force, it would induce people to negotiate beforehand, push them together because the alternative was so horrible. The downside risk, if, it would, if the panel would take only the side of one or the other, one, the one that was not chosen would be so humiliated, there would be this enormous tendency beforehand to try to reach an agreement. Hopefully, the panel would never uh, have to be used. It didn't pass in the Congress at the last moment because, although we had almost the votes in the Senate, because the President made a deal to get the support of the Teamsters Union in 1972, and a quid pro quo, quid pro quo of that deal was that we would drop support for final offer selection. I remember George Schultz called me to tell me that that deal was made, and I had to call the Republican senators who were carrying our ball um, to tell them that we were abandoning the position. It was not a pleasant conversation. Uh, the other bit, two bits of legislation which we focused on, and I have to be very brief, were an occupational safety and health bill, which George Schultz, direct, George Schultz directed us to come up with, because there was enormous pressure in the Congress to come up with legislation to deal with safety. And so it was our effort to try to compromise with the Democrats. We tried very, very hard to get in the legislation a concept of cost-benefit analysis in the setting of safety standards. Ralph Nader was very effective in preventing us from getting that directly in the legislation. We did get some things that were indirect. Finally, I would point out, uh, Anne has mentioned two ma major manpower bills. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the fact that with Mike Moscow's help when he came over to uh, the Labor Department, we focused very hard on the evaluation of our manpower programs. For, for all our legislation and for all the billions of dollars we spent on the manpower programs, the payoff for tr these training programs was pathetically small. Uh, it was a damn shame. Uh, those programs were very expensive, and the longitudinal studies showed sometimes that people would be better off if they didn't go in the programs over time than if they did, which was more than a little discouraging. But the one <coughs> other initiative that I should mention is the uh, affirmative action. It follows to a certain extent from the concern about construction industry wages. But George Schultz also had in mind the notion that we in the Labor Department had a major responsibility to accelerate the opportunities for minorities in employment. And of course, construction was an area which had over the years tended to discriminate against African Americans. So we came up with affirmative action that is to say, we came up with an interpretation of affirmative action, which was part of an executive order that had been issued for a long time before, which focused specifically on forcing employers in the construction industry originally, and then eventually the whole country, and the, all the government contractors, forcing employers to hire and promote minorities in accordance with numerical standards of goals and timetables. That initiative, has remained, I think it's probably the single worst thing we ever did in government, uh, and it has an enormously pernicious impact in generating the acceptance of quotas by another name, goals, throughout our society, in education, in employment, elsewhere, and uh, as is reflected in a case that's coming, but perhaps is coming to the Supreme Court this year, uh, some economists have concluded that the preference idea for minorities actually is, has turned out to be terribly injurious to the minorities themselves. Um, finally, I should talk a little bit about George Schultz and Jim Hudson. George, as has been mentioned, left the Labor Department to go over to OMB. Before he did that, his prestige was so high in that administration 
that the Labor Department was sort of a favored son uh, or daughter in the domestic side. And George was given such, uh, such responsibility that he was actually put in charge of the oil import task force, which was dealing with the import concern, concerns about the import of oil into the United States. As Labor Secretary, of course, he had no special expertise all, uh, about that at all. But his judgment and wisdom was so trusted. What is not sufficiently appreciated, his original undersecretary who became uh, secretary, Jim Hodson, was an enormously capable man too. And Jim did a wonderful job. I, I had the pleasure of serving as his undersecretary. Unfortunately, he made a mistake once at White House instance. He attacked George Meany, uh, which destroyed his effectiveness because George Meany responded I don't pay attention to the janitor as long as I can talk to the owner of the building, which was a reflection, which destroyed Jim's effectiveness. And it's a shame uh, because he was an enormously capable guy. In any event, uh, finally, I would end by saying it was a pleasure to have Mike as my deputy. I recruited him out of the White House uh, as a labor economist. It was he who convinced me that the minimum wage laws were injurious to the country. Uh, and we actually proposed a youth differential, partly because of Mike's instance. Bill Kilberg was a wonderful teenager, uh, and he's still only barely older than that, uh, a wunderkind, and he took over to help destroy the economy on affirmative action, and I'll leave it up to him now. Thank you. It's not clear how to follow that. You know, the Anne and Mike and Larry uh, have given you some idea of many of the important domestic initiatives uh, that we had at the Department of Labor in the Nixon years. Because of those programs and domestic programs generally in the, in the Nixon administration, one might think of that time as merely an extension or completion of the great society. It certainly reflected, as Anne indicated, the social consciousness of the time. But it also reflected a reaction to overreaching in the great society. Thus, while recognizing a role for government, it sought, and I think some of Larry's comments underscore this, it sought to limit the reach and intrusion of that role. The administration favored affirmative action, but just as it favored other civil rights measures, it would come to oppose busing for school integration, and it disavowed the use of employment quotas for the hiring and promotion of minorities and women. It supported pension reform, but it warned of the moral hazard of government-provided non-risk-based insurance for retirement plan terminations. In taking these positions, the Nixon administration would at times strain its relations with organized labor, or at least with elements of it, but would maintain or even expand its space among blue-collar workers. Let me address two examples in more depth. The origination of the contract compliance program depended on statistical analysis looking toward hypothetical availabilities of minorities and women. Furthermore, it assumed that discrimination, if any had occurred, was societal, not necessarily tied to any individual employer. These characteristics, when combined with numerical standards, were what made the legal issues surrounding the constitutionality of the program so difficult, and what gave rise later to the self-criticism of the OFCC, OFCC program. The AT&T and steel industry consent cases presented situations where there were defined groups of individuals who had been subjected to discrimination in job assignments 
and were continuing to suffer from that discrimination. As was common at the time, jobs were often characterized as female jobs or male jobs, black jobs or white jobs. Thus, women applying for employment with the phone company invariably were directed to operator positions or simple line assigners. Blacks looking to work in the steel industry were invariably directed to jobs in the hot end of the industry, in the coke ovens, rather than in the better, well, not better paying, but better jobs in the coal end of the industry, the rolling side of the mill. Even after passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, women and blacks were locked into their positions because union seniority rules made it impossible for them to use company or plant-wide seniority to compete for jobs that had hitherto been denied to them. With the support of then solicitor Dick Schubert, Under Secretary Silverman was recused from involvement with the AT&T case. And I was then serving as associate solicitor for labor relations and civil rights. I sought to put together a government-wide settlement of all outstanding equal employment matters, first with the entire Bell system and then with the steel industry that would meet the legal standards that I understood the president wanted us to uphold. Let me put this in context. In 1972, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission had yet to obtain the right to bring cases in court. It was basically a conciliation agency. It did not have litigation authority until after passage of the 1972 amendments to the Civil Rights Act. It was an agency that had a mission to conciliate, but at the same time it had an aggressive staff that wanted to litigate and favored radical change. In a creative action, the EEOC had brought a complaint with the Federal Communications Commission seeking to deny approval of AT&T's request for an increase in its long distance rates on the grounds that AT&T discriminated against women. The EEOC was insisting that AT&T adopt strict employment quotas for the employment of women in craft jobs and the employment of men in telephone operator jobs. The Department of Labor's Contract Compliance Authority, in which we reviewed AT&T as a government contractor, was somewhat undercut by the reality that we dared not cut off phone service to the entire United States government. I enlisted the Department of Justice to represent the Labor Department and the Office of Federal Contract Compliance in a breach of contract action against the phone company. Our allegation was that they had breached their commitment not to discriminate. I also garnered the support of the Department's Wage Hour Administration, which had authority for the enforcement of the Equal Pay Act. And I approached EEOC Chairman Bill Brown promising the EEOC lead status on any caption for a nationwide federal consent decree that would be filed in federal court. If they would join us and work with the Department and the Department of Justice on a comprehensive solution. On January 18, 1973, we announced an historic agreement that included support from the IBEW although not from the Communication Workers of America, and that permitted women to exercise company-wide seniority to bid for higher paying craft jobs and provided them the incentive of a payment, if they were successful, to compensate them for the delay they suffered in being allowed to compete. There were no quotas, and numerical goals were based on the availability of existing qualified women already in the employ of the phone company. A year later, by which time I was solicitor of the department, we replicated the principles of the AT&T agreement in the steel industry consent decree. Nine steel companies in the United Steelworkers of America agreed to replace department-wide seniority 
with plant-wide seniority for most production, I'm sorry, for most promotion, transfer, layoff, and recall decisions. This allowed hundreds of black workers who were in the dirtiest, hottest jobs in the industry to successfully compete for jobs in the cleaner, cold end of steel manufacturing. These workers were red circled to protect their rates of pay when the transfer required moving to a lower rated position. This plus back pay and the use of aspirational goals targeted at the victims of discrimination, but no quotas, transformed the gender and racial makeup of two major industries while trampling on the rights of no innocent employees. Talk a little bit about ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. In January 1971, there was a committee headed by Peter Flanagan, some debate among Larry and Mike and I as to its characterization, but I remember it being referred to as the Committee on the Blue Collar Worker. And it included representatives of the Labor Department, Commerce, and Treasury. This committee turned its attention to pension reform. This is a subject that prior administrations, most notably both the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, had worked on. And it had garnered the long-term attention of Senator Jacob Javits, who had first introduced a bill in 1967. The auto and steel workers unions wanted a government termination insurance program to provide assistance to current and future retirees in the event companies could no longer fund their retirement plans. They opposed any private risk-based system because they argued the weakest companies would pay the most in premiums and that might tip them over the, age, the edge of solvency. The building trades and the Teamsters Union generally opposed any regulation of the private pension system because their members participated in collectively bargained plans for the most part, and they feared that any increase in the cost for the administration of those plans would result in the diminution of benefits. Also, since union officers were involved in the administration of those plans, they opposed any fiduciary standards that might apply to those individuals. Employer groups generally supported standards of conduct and disclosure rules. Some employer groups also endorsed enhanced vesting and funding rules, but termination insurance was seen as a costly, unnecessary complement to funding rules. On December 8th of 1971, the Nixon administration proposed legislation that included fiduciary standards of conduct and a very clever vesting rule that focused on older workers who were most threatened by benefit forfeiture. More important, the administration favored individual retirement accounts, which would permit employees without pensions to contribute up to $1,500 a year or 20% of earnings, whichever was less, to an account in their own names, deduct the contribution from their federal taxes, and pay no taxes on earnings until withdrawal at retirement. Thus, the administration came down on the side of individual responsibility for retirement savings, much to the chagrin of organized labor. Two years later, in 1973, the administration's recommendations were in the hands of a newly created National Economic Policy Council, formed, uh, chaired by former Secretary of Labor and then Secretary of the Treasury, George Schultz and vice-chaired by Assistant OMB, OMB Director Ken Dam. The Department of Labor was represented by my office, the Office of the Solicitor. Treasury and Labor agreed that pension participants be allowed to withdraw their vested pension benefits and roll them over into an individual retirement account upon termination of employment. This was a new aspect of the IRA proposal. We also agreed that the bill would include both a funding and a termination insurance provision. We disagreed because the Treasury wanted the termination insurance provision housed at Treasury. We wanted it housed at the Labor Department. The President had to make the decision. The President decided 
that the administration would oppose termination insurance. It would be housed in neither agency because we would not support that provision. And he did so expressing concern regarding the moral hazard of having a termination insurance program, arguing that it would be an incentive to aggressive increases in benefits without providing adequate funding. George Schultz and I would brief the press on the administration's position on April 11, 1973. By 1974, organized labor had gotten most of its way. It was forced to accept fiduciary standards, but got most of the rest of what it want, wanted, including a termination insurance program, the creation of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which would be housed in the Labor Department but for administrative purposes, but independent of the department. Time has proven the president correct in his concerns with regard to termination insurance. In fact, the Congress has, over the last 35 years, been forced to shore up the termination insurance program numerous times, revising the premium formula, tightening funding rules, limiting the ability to terminate plans, and increasing employer liability of plan, plan termination. At the same time, the number of defined benefit plans protected by termination insurance has nevertheless decreased dramatically, and employees have found that more of their retirement savings has been put at the risk of the market. At the same time, Individual retirement accounts have proven to be a winning concept, providing employees with increased security and enhanced portability when the increase in employee mobility has made it most important. A few general thoughts on those years. President Nixon had promised in the 1968 campaign that he would reach out to working people. He fulfilled that pledge with a host of initiatives to improve the lot of working people and to make the workplace a safer place. Not everything that was done was wise. For example, wage and price controls. But the larger picture reflects well on the effort, I think. There was an open relationship with organized labor, which represented, of course, a much more substantial part of the private workforce then than it does now but it was not always a friendly one. Nevertheless, the AFL-CIO officially remained neutral in the 1972 race, and Nixon garnered significant blue-collar support. Indeed, the so-called Reagan Democrats were originally a creation of Richard Nixon. An irony of our success, maybe something we should discuss, is its contribution to the demise of organized labor in the private economy. As government regulation expanded, workers have seen less and less of a need for the protections provided by union representation. Thank you. Well, thank you all. I think we've, uh, we've got the afternoon planned for here. There's so much to follow up on and cover. But let me start with something a little bit on the lighter side, but to your last point, Bill, about the relationship generally with labor before we get into the why. Uh, it has been said that Nixon liked labor individually, and McGovern and the Democrats liked them as a mass. Um, with that in mind, um, and a little unknown story is that in 1970, although it's very much a matter of record, President Nixon, probably the first time and last time, uh, invited uh, labor on Labor Day. Members of the AFL-CIO, uh, the presidents of the various uh, unions, um, to honor the labor leaders. Uh, never before in the White House had that happened. Uh, George Meany, of course, was there, and at that time there were 20 million members of organized labor in the country. Um, the president toasted Meany. And he toasted him as a, for his patriotism, his character, his family, his country, freedom, because he also toasted him as he believed in a strong free labor movement. Larry, you were there. 
Um, do you want to address that a little and, and talk about it in the context, one, of uh, 1970, and two, uh, uh, ultimately, much of what the Nixon administration and you all worked on and put in place, to Bill's point, started to diminish a need for organized labor because of federal regulation. So it, it was a social event that had great moment, but a late It was a comment. black tie dinner uh, on, uh, honoring the labor movement. And uh, it was a precursor, of course, to the efforts to gain labor's acceptance, ultimately neutrality, in the 72 election, a neutrality which was in no small part aided by the selection of George McGovern, who uh, George Meany, Lane Kirkland, and the leadership of the AFL-CIO uh, formed a major distaste for. They they disliked him intensely, uh, as much for his national security views as anything else. Uh, it was part of my job to try to gain the support of the AFL-CIO in 72. Um, and the, what we did gain is active support from the building trades unions, many of the building trades unions, specifically endorsed uh, Nixon. Uh, Seafarers did as well, I was reading, is that right? Yes, and the, Teamsters, and, and the Teamsters. Teamsters. Of course, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. the qu quid pro quo for the Teamsters support was the dropping of the uh, final offer selection legislation. But uh, the AFL-CIO was just intensely distrustful of uh, the McGovern wing of the Democratic Party. They were appalled at the, uh, what had happened when uh, the Scoop Jackson wing of the Democratic Party seemed to dissolve before their eyes. They were very troubled. It's quite astonishing amongst, uh, when you compare the labor movement of the 60s and 70s with today, not only as Mike said, uh, you have such an enormous decline in the portion of the labor, uh, of labor or, uh, represented by organized labor, and, and of course Bill made it true. It has, the labor movement has shifted even within those limited bounds, far to the left, as you have a much higher percentage of public employee unions, their political views are much to the left of where the old building trades were, or even the industrial unions, um, as a result of which you uh, see quite a, a shift in the politics of the Democratic Party. Um, but, and certainly on national security matters, the uh, AFL-CIO is, which back in the 60s and 70s, was anti-detente. It was to the right of Nixon and Kissinger. Now it's far to the left of uh, not only the Republicans, but many of the Democrats. Amazing shift. Michael, maybe comment on the growth uh, and uh, efforts for public sector job creation which also built a constituency for labor over these many years, um, <laughs> coming out of even all the wonderful initiatives we made. Well, there are a couple of things. Let me just first comment on this Please. decline in union membership mm -hmm. in the private sector of the economy. I think it's primarily due to the changing structure of the economy, the reduction in manufacturing jobs in the economy and the growth of service jobs in the economy. This is a long-term trend. Uh, that I think is the major, one of the major drivers for the reduction in um, uh, the, the percentage of the, our workforce that's unionized. Of course, the growth in the union, unionized portion has been in the public sector, as you say, primarily at the city level and the state level, public school teachers and so forth. And many, many states now have uh, laws providing for collective bargaining rights for public sector employees. Uh, so that's been the growth portion uh, of the work of the unionized, uh, of the members of the FLCIO. I think what uh, you're referring to is there was, a, when the Nixon administration was trying to increase employment and reduce unemployment, there was one initiative that uh, in retrospect was a mistake, I think was creating what we called purpose public service jobs, where we would directly fund uh, unemployed people to work in government jobs at the city and state level. 
Uh, it was a temporary program, fortunately, and uh, it hasn't been repeated since then. Well, shovel ready and stimulus might be a close cousin, but I'm not going to say that, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> how, how big was it, Mike? I can't yeah, recall. I don't I recall, uh, I don't think but, but there was enormous pressure to spend the money quickly yeah. and get people on the payrolls very yeah. quickly Sounds before familiar. the 72 <laughs> election. Well, and CETA fed that later. I yeah. mean, it, was in, it was on the same cloth, although not, not the same program exactly. Uh, I would also point out in terms of the decrease in uh, private sector, the, the density of unionization in the private sector, is increasing competition. In areas where you have seen deregulation that resulted in increasing competition, for example, in uh, uh, trucking, uh, the world has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. and at our time, uh, the trucking industry was largely unionized, predominantly Teamsters. Today, there are two large, non, uh, two large trucking companies that are unionized. The majority of the industry is non-union. Uh, even in manufacturing, uh, where we've lost four and a half million from 1977 to the present time, we've lost four and a half million uh, unionized jobs. We, the non-union sector in manufacturing has actually increased by a million and a half since 1977. So what you've seen is a uh, increase in competition uh, and where there has been increasing competition, uh, often unionized companies have lost out to non-union companies. And the shift in construction is equally dramatic. Much of that helped, frankly, by the civil rights laws. It wasn't just the Philadelphia plan, and as, uh, as Larry indicated, that wasn't George Schultz's primary focus, uh, but the reality is that by uh, opening construction jobs to minorities, we also increased the number of construction workers and put pressure on their ability to monopolize uh, the control of labor. I, I think, think you also have to add more sophisticated management. Yes. I mean, yes. Manage management yes. got much better. Uh, at uh, sort of managing the workforce and uh, giving employees the right to participate even when they weren't unionized. So I think there's a much more, much higher degree of sophistication uh, now and people just feel they don't need a union to represent. That's true. I think you're both right about uh, the reasons for the decline, both structural and the global competition. But what puzzles me is that uh, you don't see the same decline of the uh, unionized portion of the workforce in Europe as you do in the United States, even though they, the European countries, face many of the same uh, structural and comp competitive factors we do. And yet the proportion of their unionized workforce remains pretty much the same as it was in the 70s. Very puzzling. I don't know why. Yeah. I can only say anecdotally, um, when I was at, uh, at labor with the Wright administration, I had a visit from uh, the Italian labor minister who was coping at that time with a lot of, uh, of um, the shift of North Africans into Italy and also not as many jobs. And so we sent him on a tour of our training centers. I don't think this is the answer, but he said, uh, when he came back, I know how you've created all those jobs. And I said, what did you find out? And he said, you're open on Sundays. <laughs> um, the point is our whole structure was so different on taxes and everything else, but that's a, a whole other subject, but it's a good one. Let me come back to something that we haven't really talked about either uh, at our dinner last night, warming up, or today. Uh -oh. And you've mentioned it, uh, two things. One, yes, employers became more sophisticated. I know I used to say to them, adapt before Congress adopts, but what about Congress? Many, a couple of the comments you all made had to do with the initiatives of the administration being asked by Congress, send us something. Can you address what Congress was like at that point? Because they really were, by and large, democratic Congress with I ties I to labor. Do you I once gave a speech in which I said there are four parties in the Congress that are relevant to the Labor Department. There, is, there are the Southern Democrats, there are the Republicans, the AFL-CIO, which largely controlled all the Northern Democrats, and Javits. <laughs> he, was an independent, he was an independent <laughs> factor, uh, enormously brilliant, uh, exasperating in some respects mm -hmm. uh, on matters that he thought were too conservative, mm -hmm. but occasionally very helpful. Um, but that, that's sort of the way things worked the Southern Democrats, of course, were 
uh, in many respects more conservative than many of the Republicans. Uh, the structure of Congress and the parties was quite different those days than it is today. Well, I've often felt uh, in more recent times, and I said this to Lane Kirkland, they've abdicated their leadership to Congress. They. They, the labor, AFL-CIO, because they've given to them all these rules and protections and initiatives rather than fighting for it or bargaining for it from today child care and family leave items but certainly discrimination and jobs for women and appropriate training and all of that. Has That's been a sensitive subject in the labor movement. If you, you know the people utterly forget except for a few historians that the old AFL mm -hmm. before it merged with the CIO opposed unemployment insurance, opposed the minimum wage law, opposed all sorts of legislation for precisely that reason. They didn't want the government to take those over because they would reduce the Collective purpose bargaining. and need for unions. Mm -hmm. right. But Bill? just a, just a word on, on the, the era. I mean, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was the William Steiger Act. Right. It was Bill Steiger uh, from Wisconsin in the, uh, in the House. Uh, John Erlenborn uh, from Illinois uh, was a key player in, in Arissa Alqui from Minnesota. Uh, these were people that we worked with on a regular basis. Now, Javits clearly was a dominant figure, certainly in the Senate, uh, even though he was in the minority. Uh, you know, he had enormous influence over what the Senate Labor Committee would do and, and what the direction uh, of legislative initiatives would be. But there were leaders in the House as well, uh, and they were bipartisan. In fact, it was the, it was the Republicans I would argue, who were certainly the more creative and the more aggressive, because so often the Democrats uh, were waiting for their guidance from the AFL-CIO. Yeah, the truth of the matter, the Republicans were playing a defensive game. Even Bill Steiger, who, with whom I was very close, took over the, uh, the sponsorship of that bill because we begged him to do so in order to reduce the power of the Democrats and the AFL-CIO. We wanted a more of a compromise. So. Uh, not, it's not quite true that the Republicans were pressing those, those issues. But, it, I mean, but, but the, the environment in the Congress was completely different than yes, it is today. Is, I mean, there was much more bipartisanship, people working together. That's true, uh, because but, as I said earlier, the Southern Democrats were to the right of many of the yeah. Republicans, and there were all sorts of really liberal Republicans like uh, Schweiker and Javits and Case who were to the left of uh, many Democrats. But I have to tell one wonderful story about this. Uh, I went up to, with George Schultz to meet with Senator Yarborough, who was chairman of the Labor Committee from Texas. He was not a uh, rocket scientist. Uh, <laughs> he said and, nice things about you. But yeah, he's, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's no longer alive. So, uh, but in any event, we were, worse. <laughs> we, were talking, we were talking with him about uh, <clears throat> labor legislation dealing with farm work. Uh, because he had wanted an initiative on that. And George uh, was explaining what, their, what the problems were. And he was going on for about a half hour, and I could see that Yarbrough was getting a little bored. And a phone call came in. And he, uh, you know, George was such an important labor secretary. A phone call comes in, and, and Senator Yarbrough said, I can't interrupt now. I'm in an important meeting. I'm in an important meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture. <laughs> So George and I went back in the car together, and George said, what did you think about it? And I said, well, I think he's a dummy. Uh, uh, and George said, that can't be true. He's been elected to the Senate a number of times. He's got, got to be competent. You should be more charitable about him. I said, I still think he's a dummy. <laughs> well, uh, the history will tell you. <laughs> but that, back to George Schultz then, um, uh, if there were... Uh, was a Congress that was more bipartisan and therefore more encouraging to uh, the compassion and initiatives of the, the Nixon administration's labor uh, activities. Um, George and, more creative, had, and more creative, and more creative at coming up with alternative ways right. of getting things done. Right. Well, that's a fair point. Right. That's certainly true. Well, and with that in mind, George Schultz, uh, I think uh, we know, uh, was a supporter of of cabinet gov government, because it worked well. He was a phenomenal cabinet officer. Well, what did this idea of bringing more of the policy making into the White House, stronger domestic policy, 
uh, organization. Um, cabinet departments execute the policies that might come out. Um, that was uh, probably the first of really strong domestic policy, strong White House on policy initiatives, and yet the labor agenda was huge, and the labor initiative out of the Labor Department huge. Can you talk a little bit about that time with the White House organization and the growth of, of if you will, uh, a more centralized economic uh, set of agencies, as I understood it? Uh, well, I think uh, consolidation. Uh, I guess the president had it. enormous confidence in George Shultz, mm -hmm. and George really took, to a certain extent, the labor portfolio in some part with him when he went over to OMB. Uh, but uh, but Jim Hodgson had George's confidence, um, so I think therefore the president was inclined to allow the labor department to run as it wished because he trusted George. I don't think he had anywhere near that kind of confidence in other domestic cabinet secretaries, mm -hmm. <laughs> and certainly not the State Department. Michael, you were in the White House at one point, and then outside. What's your take on the role of the White House in those days and the efficacy of some kind of super cabinet structure? Well, I um, was it. Uh, Council of Economic Advisors, Advisors, then the Labor Department, and then HUD. Mm -hmm. And when I was at HUD in Nixon's second term, of course, he set up these super cabinet officers. And Jim Lynn, who was then secretary of HUD, uh, was in charge of one group of cabinet agencies. I think it was something like community development or community and urban development. He had an office in the White House, or at OMB, the old executive office building, and of course uh, at the sec uh, Secretary of HUD, and he was back and forth between the two. He had a person working for him at the uh, OM, at the old executive office building who would handle these broader responsibilities, and uh, of course I think this lasted less than a year, mm -hmm. uh, this structure. Just, I mean, to have one cabinet officer overseeing other cabinet officers, I think, was doomed to failure. Uh, now, of course, Watergate was going on, too, and a lot of other things were happening, but I don't think that structure would, would have been viable on a long-term basis. Well, Mike, from the White House point of view, what, do you think I was right about George Shultz having a sort oh, of I dominant role in the domestic area and that no other domestic cabinet officer had that kind Well, perhaps Butts did as Secretary of Agriculture, but nobody else I thought of. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Uh, I was at, um, as a member of the CA staff, we were and I was the labor economist there, so I was always dealing with labor issues. And I think there's no question that the president had a lot of confidence in George Shultz. And, and his area of responsibility just kept growing, and as evidence when he, OMB, Secretary of Treasury, and so forth. Now, he, goes, he will go down in history as one of the outstanding secretaries of labor. Mm -hmm. Bill, comment on the uh Relationship between relationship the White House. Voice. Well, I had a relationship at the White House at the time. <laughs> well, we know, but uh, nothing, per <laughs> nothing personal, please. <laughs> uh, much of much of my understanding of it really came from uh, from Bobby, and she would often tell me that uh, you you don't really appreciate how things work because you're at the Labor Department, you're working for George Shultz, and uh, it's it's you know it's quite a bit different at other agencies. Uh, so my sense certainly was the same during those early years, and I think it, it carried through. Now, things changed after 1972, 1973, when Peter Brennan came in, uh, and that was a you know that was a different attempt, uh, a different view of, of governing, um, and and Pete you know came out of the building trades in New York, and I think it was a you know his appointment was a political outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was, he certainly didn't have the knowledge of government or of the programs that the department was responsible for in the same way that uh, Schultz and Hodson had. Uh, and that lasted about two years. And then, of course, we were into the Ford administration and uh, John Dunlop and then Bill Ussery and things returned to the, to the model that we had gotten, that we had known earlier. I can tell one sort of anecdote about Please. the White House labor. I was a CEA staff member for a year, and then Larry offered me the job of heading this construction industry collective bargaining commission, and it was a compromise. I worked half time, for six months I worked half time at CEA and half time at labor. And at CEA, we were very worried about the Davis-Bacon Act. So we 
and an old saying in government, you know, you never sign anything you write, you never write anything you sign. We <laughs> drafted a memo for Paul McCracken to send to the Secretary of Labor outlining sort of a different way to administer the Davis-Bacon Act with some specific suggestions. And McCracken sends it over to um, Hodson. And uh, I then go, um, then take this job at the Labor Department in the afternoon. I go to the Labor Department. And you and respond. Hodgson sends this down to me to draft a response <laughs> for him to go back to McCracken. Answering <laughs> yourself. Where I was. <laughs> Speaking of Davis Bacon, just to loop back to your comment, it struck me um, that um, suspending the Davis Bacon Act was clearly an amazing action at that time, and uh, and Nixon wasn't strong. Do you think he had that in his back pocket at that point, and that was more important strategy yeah, actually, for him? Yeah, I was I was a little bit involved in that. Well, that was you know? that was designed to hit them in the head to get their attention. Right. We knew that was going to we're going to back off that. Right. Uh, but, but is that why he wasn't tough in the meeting, is what I'm getting he, back to. He was yes. not, he was he not. He knew he wanted to do no, that. No, we were talking about that earlier. He just didn't like confrontation. He didn't like confrontation, okay. So it was and, and also, I mean, these were some of the people in the room supported him mm -hmm. in the uh, Cambodia invasion and the Vietnam policy, and that may have sure. led him to not be as tough as he was supposed to be in that meeting. Interestingly, Davis Bacon has been suspended twice since then, of course. Mm -hmm. By in hurri after Hurricane Andrew, it was Katrina. George Bush, right. and after Katrina, after twice Katrina. it was suspended I know, I know. Uh, since then on national emergency grounds. Mm -hmm. Bill, uh, ERISA, when I was Labor Secretary, uh, my Walter Mitty fantasy was uh, to understand ERISA. But having <laughs> said that, I never got there. Uh, I'm curious, <laughs> I think there's a difference of opinion. Larry, you, uh, you never liked PBGC, you didn't want any part of it. Bill, you were at the creation in part and an expert Well, in the under the first Nixon uh, term, uh, we w didn't want any substantive uh, standards for uh, pensions. We wanted to put in legislation that would simply develop a federal fiduciary standard. Right. And we did not want to, partly because, as you described, the moral hazard, partly because we were afraid if we put in, I argued strongly, if we put in any regulation, we would reduce employers' incentives to create new pension programs, which of course happened. They, uh, so we thought it was a foolish, uh, I thought it was a foolish uh, mm -hmm. initiative, uh, except for the uh, fiduciary standards, which were, uh, different state laws were very confusing about what fiduciary standards applied to uh, trustees of pensions. But uh, when I left, then these left-wing types like Bill got involved, and they pushed <laughs> through this uh, pension legislation. Well, actually, the the uh, first term, the Nixon proposal in 1971, Larry's partially right. You had uh, you, you did have this, uh, fiduciary standards. You also had a vesting standard. We did actually, we did. True. and that was and that was uh, perhaps a little bit of a sop. Uh, You're towards right. organized labor. You're right. Um, and the, in, the individual retirement account came about. That was that was an idea in the first term, and it was it was one of the great ideas. Uh, there was a study done under Ken Dam about termination insurance, and it was as a result of that study uh, that Ken and I uh, decided that it made sense to support a termination insurance proposal. Uh, and we did, but the president reversed us. And as I say, we, the issue that went to the president was where should it be located, and the answer that came back is it shouldn't be had. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the position, that was the administration position that we, uh, that we took. Can yeah. I ask Bill one quick Please, question? Please, do. Did Brennan ever get involved in any of these policy discussions and issues? Interestingly enough, he got deeply involved in, in minimum wage, and the, the youth differential proposal, and that, of course, that set Meany off. And, uh, you know, Brennan then had a serious problem because he had no communication with the AFL-CIO, and that was one of the major raisins d'etre, uh, you know, for him. That was one of the reasons that he, that he was appointed. That, that, uh, so he did get involved in, in that issue uh, and selective other issues where he felt he had, he had some knowledge and something to contribute. We could go on all afternoon, but the hour draws nigh. We promised ourselves we'd stop after 90 minutes. I do want to make one point in closing, because I think this is a very unique panel.
this is our 15th or 16th panel. You have before you a group of people who were leaders 40 years ago uh, uh, in the area of the Department of Labor. And today, these people are still leaders. Uh, Anne, was, Anne was one of the first successful recruitments of, of women to high-level positions. Uh, she's a, a huge leader today in private enterprise and in, in public charities. Uh, Michael is a prominent economist and has served for a long time on the Chicago uh, uh, section of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, Larry, uh, just a fantastic individual, holder of the Medal of Freedom, 19 years a judge on the uh, circuit court for the D.C. Circuit. Uh, and even as a senior judge, within the last month or two, authored the opinion of the D.C. Circuit on the challenge to uh, the Affordable Care Act, which is on its way to the Supreme Court. And Bill, youngest of them all, my classmate from Harvard Law School, my classmate as a White House fellow, uh, assigned to the Department of Labor, uh, uh, as I was at Treasury, uh, he goes back to the Department of Labor, stays there, uh, becomes solicitor. Today he runs a, uh, the Washington office of a hugely prominent national law firm. And he's Boeing's counsel uh, in fighting the NLRB decision to, to justly, uh, 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 to unjustly prevent the, uh, the plant in, in South Carolina. But what's phenomenal is 40 years then of leadership and today of leadership, and it's, it's really a tribute to the recruitment and the people that were brought into the next administration. We try to do these forums monthly. The next one is uh, out at the Nixon Library on the all-volunteer army. Uh, you needn't travel out there. We hope to have it filmed, and we thank you for coming today. Good day to you.